Hello, everybody, and welcome to Taking Control, the ADHD podcast on Rashpixel.fm. I'm Pete Wright, and right over there is Nikki Kinzer. Hello, everyone. Hello, Pete Wright. Hello, Nikki Kinzer. How are you? I, you know, we're all sick. We're all sick, so I'm trying to keep my keep my mood up. I drank some tangerine tea infused with, what is that, like yerba mate something. It's some like caffeine infused leaf. And it says it's supposed to give you energy and mood enhancement. And I need a mood enhancement. (laughs) Did it work? (laughs) I think so. Good. I think so. I don't know. When I smile, does it go cling? Yeah. Like, do I have a twinkle in my eye? very cheery. I hope so. We're talking, we're t- it's a Q&A episode today. It's a, a glorious, the glorious and supreme Q&A episode, uh, taking on some questions that have been coming in over the last several weeks for our workplace episode. This was fun. It was fun. And good questions, too. Yeah, right. Good questions. Lots of meat. Lots of meat on these bones to, mm-hmm. to talk about. So we're going to be taking on these questions uh, momentarily. Before we do that, head over to TakeControlADHD.com and get to know us a little bit better. You can listen to the show right there on the website or subscribe to the mailing list, and we'll send you an email each time a new episode is released. Of course, you can connect with us on Twitter or Facebook at Take Control ADHD. And if this show has ever touched you, consider allowing this show to touch you back. Visit patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast. You know, it's been a long time since I've reminded folks of this, but if you are a transcript reader, if you're the kind of person who likes to go and peruse what we have said uh, over the last several uh, episodes, I should say several, many episodes, many, many moons of episodes, uh, you can do that thanks to the generous contributions of our patrons. Patrons pay for transcriptions. Getting human transcriptions uh, comes at a cost, and it's sometimes annoyingly high. And so we have a great transcriptionist, a great service that gives us reliable, fast transcriptions. And uh, I don't know if you've done this recently, Nikki, but if you go read us... I try not to. I like purposely avoid it. I feel like I'm in, I'm having a seizure. Like, what, who is this guy talking right now? Why doesn't he stop his mouth moving? I'm saying these things right now, fully aware that they're going to be transcribed. Right. And I, a message to our transcriptionist I'm sorry. I don't I, know. Right? I know. I'm what sorry. comes over me. I feel like I'm having some sort of an event. Anyway, the transcriptions were a goal for us. It was it was our very first goal was to make sure that we made enough to cover transcriptions for those uh, who need it, uh, for those who need to read because they uh, are not able to listen to the show for any reason. Uh, and we hope that it has been useful. It is an ongoing service that comes to you directly as a result of contributions through Patreon. So if you'd like to see more of those kinds of things, if you have suggestions for things that you'd like to see implemented into the show and you think Patreon support would be a great goal, we're always open to those kinds of suggestions and we appreciate your uh, participation there. So patreon.com slash the ADHD podcast and, you know, go read a transcription. It's fun. Okay. Mm-hmm. Here Very we go. entertaining. We're talking about uh, Q and A. Uh, we have this. You you have done the yeoman's work of organizing these questions into a uh, yes. something that we can talk about. Yes, and so, uh, but first, before we go into the questions, I wanted to bring up uh, a couple of really good tips that were on Discord that came from Melissa, our Discord coordinator, Discord mom. Yes, Discord mom, and uh, about online interviewing, because when we talked about interviewing, we certainly talked a lot about like in person, but we didn't really touch a whole lot on online. And she had two really good tips that I thought were really good. First of all, be aware of alternate time zones, depending on who will be interviewing, verify the time of the interview and correct time zone can save someone from showing up late or completely missing the interview. And that is so true. So true. Um, So really good thing to think about. I picked up an app for my phone called CalZones, C-A-L-Z-O-N-E-S. And it is so cool in terms of managing time zones. Uh, it shows you this, you choose all the time zones you want to manage, and then it shows you this gigantic, fantastic grid that says, if it's this time here, then it's this time in Perth, Australia. And right below the grid of time zones is your calendar, like your Google calendar. So it says, here are all your meetings, and you can go up and see when all of the, the uh, you know, what all the time zones are. So every week uh, for this show, for example, when I post the link in Facebook and Discord and Patreon, it says, here are the main time zones where we're going to 
going to start all the way through Sydney. Uh, it's thanks to calzones that keeps me on track through time changes, time, you know, time zone changes, all those sorts of things. It's amazing. Highly recommend having some sort of a source to give you that kind of relative view of, of calendars. Calzones is a great one. Link in the show notes. Absolutely. The other point was to try to have the interview on a desktop, laptop, or another stationary device. However, if that will not be an option and someone will be doing their interview via smartphone, it is wise to set up a tripod docking station to allow for a video that is not constantly wavering while the device is being held. Oh my gosh, mm-hmm. what a great tip. Because this could be so annoying. Um, from an interviewer's standpoint and could it's actually like awful. Yeah. It could actually like cost you the job. So I think this is really smart. Really yeah, smart. I do too. And a uh, little, you know, uh, tripods for your phone are super cheap, right? I mean, I have here a little m- mountable like stand for my phone and it has a little grip and I can turn it and twist it and do all sorts of things with it, tighten it up. And it was like eight bucks. Uh, and so they're super easy. Uh, grab something there. It, it's too cheap to, you know, let that come between you and a potential job. Absolutely agree. All right. So Casey Kasem over there, would you oh. like to read Are you the pointing questions? at me? Yes. Although people probably don't know who Casey Kasem is. Um, you may be um, dating yourself a little bit. I yeah. know. So let's say, uh, what's the guy? Ryan Seacrest. Ugh, Ryan Seacrest. Is he fantastic or what? That <laughs> Ryan Seacrest. He can yeah. host anything. Guy can host yeah. the heck out of stuff. Uh, okay. I, I'm going to start. Here are some questions. Uh, after you get the new job, how can you set yourself up for success? Question is, I'm starting in a new job soon and I'm finding myself thinking, I have to find the perfect organization system right now before I start. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah to that question. Right. Totally get that question. Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, uh, I know. Uh, what do you what do you think? What do you think about this one? I think that it is a great goal. However, I don't think it's very realistic. Um, It's a lot to expect, right? For you to think that you're just going to go in with the right organizing system right away, especially when you're not really sure what the job is going to be like until you're actually doing the job. So I think that that's something you have to just give yourself some patience. Um, I do recommend that you pay attention to your systems at home to make sure that you get to your new job on time and that you're prepared. So those systems definitely need to be in place and intact. Uh, but when you're there, I would just say, you know, take notes, listen carefully, ask lots of questions, review what you've learned that day, and eventually start working on a system that's going to work for that job. Um, that's that's what I would say about that. I, I think giving yourself permission to understand that, that your systems, your organizing systems at work, at the new job, old job, home, they're, they're all systems that are going to change. And so that I, I think setting yourself, like you said, like it's a lot to expect to have the perfect system. Dare I say, it's too much to expect to have the quote, perfect system right now before you start work. There's just, there's too much for you that you don't know. Uh, and and so I understand and I really relate to this idea that it's a new job. It's a clean slate. I'm going to use that as the opportunity to craft this wonderful new system before, you know, anything else gets in the way. Uh, the problem is that doesn't really exist. That's a fantasy. It's like the unicorn. You are inheriting a job, most likely, right? How how rare is it that you're actually getting a job that's never been done before? At some point, you're going to inherit someone else's system or some some process that you're going to have to learn. From there, you have the opportunity to change it. So just give yourself, uh, I think, some flexibility to to really, as you say, to to learn, to take notes, to to internalize those notes and and uh, and figure out the environment before you put too much pressure on yourself to to have the new system before you start. Absolutely. All so right, much I'll... of your personal system is going to depend, I think, on the work that's thrown at you, I guess. Oh, that's the, I, I that's agree. the thing I have to I yeah. want to really Well, on. and one thing I want to emphasize too is that it's going to change because even if you've been in the job for five, six years, uh, you're still going to change your systems as you go. 
you know, things just they and maybe not whole systems, but like I was just telling Pete today before I got on here that I was organizing my file folders on my computer because I'm working with a client who's doing it and it inspired me to do it myself. That is a system that I'm cleaning up 10 years later, right? I mean, yeah, yeah right. So everything's always kind of changing and moving around and stuff. So. Right. It's all good. All right. I'll all right. Uh, go ahead and answer this next, or not answer. We're going to both answer. I'm going to uh, state the question and you're going to answer it first. Okay. <laughs> how, right, do you, how do you set up your relationship with your supervisor in a way that will benefit you while by, wh- while maybe you should have asked the question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> while battling RSD and fighting the people pleaser in you? Uh, money works really well. Right? I think yeah, you should bribery. just uh-huh. start paying them off. Um, I, I think second to money, if you don't have the cash, uh, communication for, for me is is the big one. As somebody who's been in a position uh, of, of management, like, what do I want to see? I, I, I think the even before you take on the do I tell them or not about my ADHD conversation, just remember that open and frequent uh, communication is, is the uh, a terrific first strategy for your first few weeks at work, right? Review how you plan to do the job and and incorporate questions about processes and potentially request introductions to other people across departments that that might help you better understand the role and so on. And, And, you know, tell your supervisor, this is what you can expect from me today, this week, over the next two weeks, right? Just be open and and frequently reach out to them and say, here's what I'm working on now. And ask, is this the kind of thing you're going to expect and, and like to see from me going forward? I think, uh, you know, staying open about that and not hiding from it is um, is the best way to go. I completely agree. And and just, you know, being yourself, you know, don't just be yourself, be your authentic self, ask lots of questions, uh, especially at the beginning. This is the best time to do it uh, to get that clarification that you might need. Um, so, yeah, I agree with you. I think communication is, is the biggest key there. Uh, OK, my turn. Um, how do you get past the first few weeks where you feel totally unsure of what to do and find yourself standing around feeling super awkward? Yeah, that's an that I just have this unfortunate like picture in my mind of like the middle school dance. Yeah. <laughs> you know, where everybody is like against the wall and no one's talking to anybody and yeah. Um and then the boys are acting all crazy and <laughs> Well, boys are dumb. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hopefully right. by the time you get your you get a job at a new company, boys aren't dumb anymore. But they might be. They still might be. Right, right. right. Uh, you know, I totally understand this, especially when you're going into a new company and it's a new team and it's new people and you're going into the break room and you don't know anyone. I mean, it really does feel like that first day of school where you go into the lunchroom. Uh, but I, again, I say be yourself. It's okay to, if you're, if you're an observer, go ahead and take some time to observe and kind of scan the situation around you, you know? Um, but, I think at some point you do need to get out of that comfort zone of being an observer and get involved because this is how you will become part of the team is, is your involvement. Yeah. I, I think it's, I, that, that's a really good point. I had some other things I wanted to talk about, but this one I, I think is a, is a really good one to, to lean in on, which is, you know, if you bring some old habits, maybe some old habits that are, fine and potentially introverted habits, like maybe you're the kind of person who brings a book and reads a book at lunch every day. Um, You know, maybe you're the kind of person who enjoys going on long walks by yourself. uh, And that's that is a that's great. Do that stuff. That's all good stuff. Maybe the first couple of weeks uh, while you are just trying to get to know the place and get to know the culture, not a great time to bring those old habits to the new job. It, it might be a better opportunity for you to to say, you know, today, every day this week, I'm going to introduce myself to one new person that I haven't talked to. Or uh, this week, I'm going to sit down and see if I can have lunch with, you know, two new people twice a week this week, right? Tr- get yourself, uh, as Nikki says, out of that comfort zone, out of the old habits. This is a great opportunity to shake that up. Um, I, I also think, you know, there is an opportunity for you to just do something. 
right? If you don't know what to do, uh, pick up a manual, like learn a process, study something, embrace a new system, ask a question about how things are done and and uh, figure out if there's a better way to do it, right? Like if you truly can't figure out what to do next, it's a great way to learn and will probably help you find the boundaries of your responsibilities pretty quickly, right? People will tell you, hey, that's a thing. That's a thing that's actually outside of your responsibility. So let's steer you back here. Uh, so it's a good way to do that. But for me, I, it, the question is, this is a, it comes back to probably a social anxiety question. And, and it, it kicks up the ADHD storyteller, right? It's so easy to already get to the end of your social contract uh, at this new organization before you've had a chance to even explore what's new for you there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So the next question was, what other things should we be thinking about? And, uh, you know, I think that when I work with clients around this issue, one of the biggest things that they get nervous about is their past experiences at these last jobs. Like, I just don't want to repeat this or I don't want this to happen again. And so I would say uh, before you go into this new job, really take some time to, to think about what you learned from your last position. What what worked well for you? How can you transfer this into your new job? Um, you may not know right away, but you will soon after a few weeks of, of uh, experience. And where were you challenged? And what would you do differently if you could do it again? And again, how does this information then transfer to your new position? So it's really taking some time to, to reflect uh, the good and the bad and what do you want differently? And, and that's the coaching approach is, you know, looking forward, what can you do um, differently that, that will make you you know, feel confident. And that's really what we want. I, my big, biggest advice or biggest piece of advice is, you know, be confident. It's okay not to know all of the answers, um, but you do know some, they hired you, they hired you for a reason. And so, um, you know, even if you don't feel that confidence, fake it. Fake it, yeah. fake it, fake it. <laughs> yeah, right. Pretend like you do. Uh, you're not being a fraud. You know, you're just, uh, you're being you and it's okay not to know everything. It, totally. It is absolutely okay. And it's okay to try some things on, right? To to give yourself a chance of, to, to say like, what would it be like if I showed up at this new job and I was an outgoing guy, right? What if, what would that be like if I was the guy who just shook hands first? Because uh, everybody else is, it, you know, most likely they're going to have their head down. They're going to be doing their job. They're getting the job done. And um, but they're also probably more than willing to to shake your hand and say, welcome to the welcome to the team and, and glad to get to know you. And the, once you break the ice, the rest is the rest becomes easy. You mentioned first impressions in the interview stage, but I think that also implies to your first two weeks on the new job. So much happens in that time that will carry over for the remainder of your time in that position. It's true. I mean, I yes. think that those, you know, those first impressions, uh, that first two weeks makes a difference. Um, but again, I would just say, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. It's OK if you don't know everything. They don't they're not expecting you to be yourself. Do these things that we've already talked about. Ask questions, gather the information information, uh, review, you know, and just be you. And, and, uh, I, you know, my optimistic side is going to say everything's going to be just fine. Yeah, no, I know. I totally, I look, I rec want to recommend a book. Uh, and it's a great, have you read this book blink by Malcolm Gladwell? I've heard of it, but I'm not sure if I know what it's about. So tell us a little it's, bit about it. It's fascinating. And I'm just going to, I'm going to read a little blurb here. It's, uh, it's his second book. It was right after, um, um, the tipping point. If you haven't read the tipping point, it's another great book. Uh, it presents in popular science format research from psychology and behavioral economics on the adaptive unconscious, a mental process or mental processes that work rapidly and automatically from relatively little information. It considers both the strengths of the adaptive unconscious, for example, in expert judgment and its pitfalls, such as stereotypes. I found this book fascinating. You know, it's like his other, if you've, if you've read other of Gladwell's books, it's, it's a survey of research and yes it it does read a little bit like he he has a position right you don't read these books without understanding that the author has a position so it is not an unbiased uh presentation but it is a thorough one and uh i, I found it fascinating it does things like uh i mean he talks about the research behind how you know quickly first impressions are made and that's 
you know, what made me think about this question or this statement that, in, in fact, the uh, the research indicates that those first impressions are made in not hours or days or weeks, but seconds. And it takes much longer to unravel that first impression than we have, uh, than, than we assume. Those things are, are branded into us, right? The first impression that we get from somebody, um, from a teacher that walks into a high school classroom. They are branded from the moment they walk into the classroom, the way they walk and assert themselves into the space, the way they communicate in those first few seconds of opening their mouths. These are the lessons that we can learn from the adaptive unconscious. And it's not talking about things that necessarily you're doing, but how people are perceiving you. And so the the fact that that relationship is owned by both parties unconsciously is really important. I think the more you can do to to make your very first impression a positive one, um, the better, and it will serve you in those first two weeks, two months, two years. So I have a question for you. Do you think that your first impressions, have you ever met anyone with, and had a first impression and, and then you thought differently after getting to know them? Absolutely. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it takes a, it it does it takes a long time. Mostly because after you make that first impression, you're going to make a decision unconsciously or not about whether or not you're going to work hard to to make a relationship out of it. Right, and right, right. Like that's the choice, right? And right. so I I have a very dear friend now that I met you know years ago, and we didn't hit it off at first, right? We we had there were lots of reasons that our first impression of each other wasn't that positive, and uh, it actually we ended up traveling traveling together for a for a, a trip a work trip internationally and realized that our first impressions were completely wrong and maybe had we had an excuse to to you know um, to work that out to work on a, a project more directly together uh, it would have it would have we would have been forced to go out of our way but because that first impression was bad we didn't we never made the choice to go out of our way I never made the opportunity to help this person because uh, I just I wasn't into it. I felt like we there's too much in the way of our relationship. We're not going to be able to communicate. I made that snap judgment. And, mm -hmm. you know, of course, I'm not thinking about those things in the back of my head. Right, what I'm really yeah. thinking is I have better things to do with my time. Yeah. Uh, and so you want to make sure you leverage that. Yeah, that's so interesting. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. Recommendation. It's a great it, it's a great read. Uh, pick it up on uh, Audible. You can. It's you can get a free book if you don't have an Audible account, audible.com slash the ADHD podcast. Look what I just did there. Nicely done, Pete, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. we did have a, we had a few questions um, come through about starting your own business. We know that there's lots of uh, entrepreneurs out there with ADHD and, and uh, ADHDers who would like to be entrepreneurs. So we know this is a big topic. Next week, we have a guest. Her name is Linda Walker, and she is a coach in Canada, and she does a lot of work in the workplace and with entrepreneurs uh, specifically. And she is going to be talking to us next week about a roadmap that she has put together for ADHD entrepreneurs. So hopefully um, we do have your questions and, and uh, I'm hoping that we will be able to ask those. Uh, when Linda's here next week. So it might be a little bit longer. Yeah, it, it might be a little longer of a podcast than what you're used to, but I think well worth it. Uh, now we, we're going to change directions a little bit because we've we've had some thoughts about working from home. We, You and I had both discussed that we were going to try and shoehorn this topic in and, and uh, it seems like we have some thoughts. Yes, yes. So uh, why don't you get started and I'll kind of play off of what you say. Okay. All right. Well, I'll do my best. Uh, the the first thing I, I just was reflecting. Actually, I got up early this morning and I and I sat down to think about what is what are the things that I've learned from working from home. And we'll talk about all the other the things that you that that you'd think about working from home. Things that you and I have talked about on this show before. But the the number one thing that has helped me that it took me too long to understand is having some place that's not my office to go work, right? I spent a lot of time over the first several years of my working from home really embracing the fact that I worked from home. And so I wanted my office. I wanted a nice space where I could do some sound treatment and I could just spend all the time. All the time would be in here. And it doesn't take very long on any given day for it to start to feel like I'm in prison. And uh, <laughs> and then I get distracted, right? I right. get super distracted uh, just being in my own space too long. And so having a network, I like to call it the network of Pete's office, 
mm-hmm. where I'll go up to the Bethany Starbucks or I'll go up to Insomnia Cafe, which is over here. I'll go over to the Beaverton Library, which has a really nice spot over there to work. And I, I just have this network of places where I can hop. I can put on the headphones. I can edit. I can do whatever I need to do uh, to keep my brain engaged, to keep the bar of distraction high enough that that I can I can actually get some work done. I, finding a, a place to get out. That is the number one thing that I have uh, have had to learn that impacts that is impacted by my ADHD and impacts my ADHD in a positive way is getting out of my own home office. Uh, uh, that makes perfect sense. Perfect sense. I, I tend to not do that. I tend to work in the office unless it's summer and then I'll work outside. Um, but I there's times and part of why I have to work in the office is I have a desktop um, yeah, right. computer. So it's not as mobile or easy for me to to leave. And most of my work is done with clients. So, yeah, yeah, you know, can't really be in a client or can't really be working with a client in a coffee shop. But uh, that totally makes sense. Uh, one thing I noticed here in your notes, Pete, is you talked about setting the expectations um, of everyone in the house to understand that when you're working, the doors closed, headphones are on and you're not to be disturbed unless something's on fire. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That is definitely, I think, one of the biggest learning curves we've had in our house is just understanding that when I'm in here and the lights are on and I'm standing up, I'm probably doing some kind of video. So you need to be quiet. You know, you need to not slam the door. Um, but it's taken a long, a long time, many years, I mean, to kind of get them to to understand that. There are times where I've had to put like chairs in the hallway just so that they don't go in front of my office. Um, but now that they're older, it's not really that big of a deal. Um, but it is something to to pay attention to. I, I think I've mentioned before, I have, you know, hue lights throughout our house. And one of the lights is right in the hallway outside my office. And so I actually have a lighting scheme set up when I hit podcast lights. All the lights in my office change to a, a certain kind of light scheme and the light in the hallway turns bright red. It's like the recording light that everybody knows that even, you know, you can hear dad's voice. Sometimes he's on a call, but when he's actually recording, that light's red and uh, everybody needs to be extra quiet. It's super helpful. It's really, really helpful. So. Uh, something I just want to add, uh, if you are somebody who gets out mobile, uh, you pick up a VPN service, uh, TunnelBear, ExpressVPN, NordVPN. These are all services that allow you to encrypt your uh, communication when you're on a public Wi-Fi network. Highly recommend. Super reasonable pricing. Uh, you know, for a couple bucks a month, you can just make sure that your your data is encrypted. So it particularly, like in my case, I'm working with client data, and I don't want anybody to be able to sniff that in a public Wi-Fi right. um, situation. And so pick up a VPN. What I really like about, you know, I'm an Express VPN user. I really like the app on uh, the mobile phone, super easy to use. On the computer, it's super easy to use. Just one button and you can tell it kind of where you want to be, uh, you know, so you can appear to be from other places if you want. I could appear to be a Canadian to the internet uh, if, if <laughs> I wanted fantastic. to. Uh, so it's it's super easy if you're, if you're traveling in places you want quick, easy protection. Um, that's a, a good one to use. So. There you go. Uh, scheduling. Schedule. Yeah, yeah. Figuring out your schedule. Like what are, and, and it's it, it's not just like, I'm going to get up and go to work from eight to five. It's really bigger than that. It's what are my most productive hours for doing the job I need to do? Uh, uh, for me, you know, there are a couple of periods during the day that are great for podcasting. So I have them scheduled for podcasting. It's when my voice is strongest and once my energy is highest. Uh, when I have Focus time, it's a different time of the day. So really being able to work long enough to understand what that looks like for you uh, is is an important thing. How do you handle that? It's definitely been a work in progress over the years. You know, um, it, it one of the questions that was asked to me uh, a few years ago or a couple of years ago from a friend of mine, they said, you know, they asked isn't it hard to separate work from home? Like, do you find yourself in the office a lot, like kind of just sort of going in there. And, and at first I probably, w- I probably was in the office more than I am now outside of the, you know, Monday through Friday. So I think that that's the, 
that was the trickiest thing is actually setting, for me, setting up some kind of schedule. Like, am I going to work on the weekends? Am I not going to work on the weekends? Um, and sort of try to set those boundaries. And, uh, but I agree with you 100% of how I schedule, um, depending on energy and making sure I have time you know, in between appointments, making sure that I have time to to produce content and other things in my business that's not just coaching clients one on one that that one on one time. So it, it is just kind of a juggling. I, it, I, I'm always changing it. I mean, I, I you know, every season I kind of look at okay, what's my ideal schedule here, and how do I make this work? And um, it, it's it's a constant kind of work in progress for me. The the real challenge for for me, I think, to get over was, you know, once I started working from home, I am also like a part of the reason I did it was so that I could be more at the mercy of my kids' schedule. Mm -hmm. uh, but that means that I have to be more flexible in the hours that I'm working. Uh, right. So I might have to get up super early in the morning, like four thirty, five o'clock in the morning to get something done because I know I'm going to have to stop working to get everybody breakfast and get them out the door. Or mm -hmm. I'm going to have to, you know, stop working at 2.30 in the afternoon to go drive a carpool someplace, which means I might have to come back after dinner and wrap up some things that I had to drop that I was in the middle of. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of sprints. I, I work best when I have something timing me. And uh, so I had, for a long time, I was working these super compressed, like four-hour sprints in the middle of the day, 10 to 2, totally uninterrupted, totally focused, feel unapologetic about ignoring everything until 10 and unapologetic about ignoring everything after 2. Um, and that has been, that's great until, you know, one of your kids has an early release day and their day ends at noon or something like that. So you just got to be adaptable. I, I did hear this great tip uh, as I was uh, just sort of researching a little bit. Use laundry as a sprint timer. Everybody's got laundry to do. Uh, there's always something piled up. Throw a load in and set it to start. And 41 minutes later, you're at the end of your first sprint, right? There's Very a bell smart. that's going to ring. I love that. I love that idea. Um, so, and then you have a nice break to fold. <laughs> right. So. Do you get uh, torn between like, okay, I need to do work or I need to do the dishes? Not anymore. I used to, uh, but not anymore. To and, and I think that's something that you come to uh, as you get good at working at home. And I'm not saying mm -hmm. I'm good at working at home, but I have good days and bad days. Right. Um, the, the best, my best experience of working from home is everything's just sort of integrated throughout the day. I know I have a work list of all the projects that I have to do for my clients. And also, I have to eat. When I go in and eat lunch, I'm doing the dishes, right? Those things are getting, I'm emptying the dishwasher, I'm putting things away. Uh, when I come back to my office and I need a good sprint, I'm going to empty the the laundry and I'm going to put something else in, right? right. I'm gonna just just kind of keep keep the home stuff moving. And I look at it less as, you know, doing chores while I'm at work and more as, you know, accommodating the fact that my office is my house, uh, and, um, you know, when, when I'm at work, when I used to have an office job, you know, there were things that I would have to do there. Like, yeah, occasionally I'd have to refill the coffee filters and make a trip to Office Depot to get paper towels and supplies. You know, when you work at a small office and you don't have a service, there are things that you have to do there to keep keep the, the office upkeep, you know, right. running. And, and so I look at it like that, like I, it's just me keeping my office fresh. Mm -hmm. And um, so it just so happens that I live here, too. I ignore it. <laughs> really? Like, I have no problem just ignoring it. I If I'm going to work, I just go down the hallway. I don't look at anything around me. And I just go and, yeah. and I'm in work mode. I know it's really difficult for a lot of people to do that. And that's why I was asking. Yeah, it's for me, I, I look at them as the nourishing breaks, right? I use those things to keep moving during breaks. Sometimes the break is just I need to sit down or I need to go outside. Right. And I, I really like I need to go talk to humans. Too. So sometimes I'll just go walk down the street to the grocery store and buy something like a pack of gum just so mm -hmm. I can talk to a human being right, uh, right. and not use the self checkout. Like I just need to uh, I just need that. Yeah. Um, but again, that's why I go to coffee shops, too, if I want to get right. out of that mode. Absolutely. Um, dress for the job. Uh, I you know, it's, uh, it may not look like it, but sometimes I actually put some thought into what I wear. <laughs> 
uh, when I when I come to work. I, I wear shoes. I wear pants. I like know, we made a I joke about you that. that. Yeah. yeah, that's important, right? Yeah. That's important stuff to feel like you're at work. I find I'm more uh, attentive and uh, I am more uh, aware of the task if I'm not wearing my pajamas. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. One hundred percent. I agree. Yeah. Uh, technology, uh, just, you know, put it, making some sense of the technology you have. And I think this is something where a lot of people, first timers working at home, um, skimp early on when it, it, right. You buy cheap and you end up paying double or more for it later. You buy the cheapest computer and you end up paying more later when it breaks. You you don't get the subscription to Office or whatever services you need, Adobe, because you're trying to save some money and you end up like getting burned for it later. So figure out what are the tools that a professional in your field uses and Im- invest in those tools. If this is your job. Right. This is what you're going to be counting on income from this. Always buy up if you, as much as you can afford in terms of technology, um, equipment, like whatever you need do it. If it's furniture, if it's a massage table, if it's whatever it is, get the good stuff because this is your livelihood. And I would just I think you brought up a really good point too. I uh what do people in your profession use? And if you're not sure, ask. Um and you know, ask how people organize their clients or how they do their payment systems if you're, you know, doing some kind of service or whatever. But ask questions. And most of the time, I mean, I'm always happy to answer those kinds of questions for people who are wanting to be coaches. And so just ask um and get an idea of what of how people are doing it. Uh, if it wasn't for you, Pete, I mean, gosh, you've shared everything with what I use, like I got from you. So it's important to talk to other people who know technology and can get you get you set up. Um, so I, yeah, very important point. Uh, you know, I I work with a, a number of therapists, and and their big issue is furniture, and uh, you know, making sure that the couch and the chairs that they're going to be sitting on are good ones. Right. If you're going to be spending eight hours a day sitting in a chair listening to someone, it better be the best chair that you can you find. You have to love it. You have to love the chair. Yes. Uh, so, so I, you know, think I, just think about those those sorts of things. Uh, social media. Uh, I don't know if that sound translates to podcasting. <laughs> I think it does. Uh, I. I, I Tips: Remove social media from. I, yeah, your I remove it exactly. Phone, you just sign yeah. out of all your accounts if you can. The real challenge is if your work as a, a, a remote worker actually calls on you to be in social media. Uh, that hopefully, if you're that person, you will love it a little bit more, and and you'll have some some better gates around it. What we're really referring to here is use of personal social media while you are at work. Right, not business. Like I have a business page. I'm that I don't really consider social media i mean it is but i'm connecting not to you it is to the people who are reading it and and so i think figuring that out uh, figuring out that balance in general i start conservative get it off of the devices that you use to get work done if you are strong enough to be able to embrace it you know little by little and bring it back into your life great Uh, but figure figure out what it's like to work from home without it first set set some some rigorous goals and see how you need to adjust accordingly um you know and last uh, for me at least uh, accountability partners mm-hmm. it, it's hard when you're working for yourself um, oh very much so right to have somebody to tell you know we used to have these stand-up meetings at, at an old job you know everybody on the team would come in and we'd have an 8 a.m stand-up meeting everybody would come in he'd bring your list here are the things i'm working on today i'm gonna get some coffee and i'm gonna get to work and i'm gonna accomplish one two three these are the things i'm gonna do i'm gonna talk to these clients i'm gonna work with these people i'm gonna get this ad copy prepped that's all great and then you work from home and you realize i have no other humans here to talk to. And I so, really could do whatever I want. <laughs> exactly. And when I could do whatever I want, sometimes I will not do whatever I should be doing. So, right. you know, I use my wife, honestly. She's, I sometimes will just go start talking to her while she's doing other stuff. And I'll just say, these are the things I'm going to do. And she'll look at me and she'll say, what now? And I'll say, thanks. And I'll walk away. Mm-hmm. And it's just the act of having said it to another person. There's something about that, that, that triggers a responsibility vibe for me that says, I'm going to go now get this done or put it 
it in a text. Or if you're working with somebody like a client relationship, tell them, text them and say, hey, these are the things I'm working on for you today. And uh, I'll check in with you later, let you know when they're done. Yeah, Yeah, that's a great idea. So what do you think? Oh, I agree. I mean, I think that any any accountability partner in any shape and form or any shape and form, whether it's, you know, doing a habit and having an accountability partner or or like what you're talking about just on a daily basis with work, I think is a great idea. I love the support. I think that depending on the industry you're in, you know, definitely find people that you can talk to and connect with. Um, It's really lonely to try to do something by yourself and not know what to do and not have anybody to, to bounce ideas off of. So I would definitely say reach out to people in your industry. Um, and, uh, and find those people that that are doing the same thing you're doing or working towards kind of the same goals. There's lots of different ways to do that. And unfortunately, some of them are on social media because they're these like Facebook groups. But if you can, in a way, separate that, that that is work and you're not going on your personal feed. Um, but uh, I think it's I think it's a great idea. Absolutely. I, I think it, in terms of accountability and finding a way to be accountable to yourself, one of the, w- the February workshop, for, if you're a supreme supporter of the ADHD podcast on Patreon, you'll have access to the February workshop that we're going to be recording here very soon, where we're talking about building in some of these accountability, um, you know, tools into your life. What are some of the tools you can, you know, build your accommodations, uh, your set of accommodations at work? And, uh, I just want to throw out again, time tracking, right? If you're if you're not tracking your activity using a tool or some sort of a system that allows you to track your activity, it is always illuminating the first time you go through a week of rigorously tracking what you're doing and when and how long it takes you to do things. It's always illuminating. Whether you're able to take what you learn and turn it into, you know, uh, additional productivity, enhanced kind of focus, that's a, a different story. But you will learn something from figuring out how to track your time. And there are a lot of tools that will help you do that. Um, And, uh, you know, we'll talk about some of those on the February workshop. So we're recording that very soon. Uh, Check that out. And that is for Supreme Supreme members of Patreon. uh, Patreon. Yeah. So there you go. All right. Um, Great stuff. I do, I do have, I did want to throw in a bonus. Uh, ambient noise. I have, oh, m- yes. I have always have some ambient noise going around in my office when I'm not actually actively recording. I have either ocean waves or jungle birds or a city, whatever, something to keep the noise in my office at a certain level when I'm trying to actually think. So if I'm not doing something related to audio, I put the sounds of life in my office to keep me feeling like I, I just to trick my brain. Yes. And I also, if you notice, uh, if you're on video, if you're seeing this, uh, the live stream, there's a, uh, what is that called? Essential oil diffuser that I have in my office. And so, um, I have different scents and I will put that on because it makes the, the office smell nice. And for me too, it's, it's nice to come into an office that I like. And so I've decorated it. I've, you know, have put the colors that I like and my vision board and some of the things that are important to me. And so I think it's, it's nice to just make it a place I want to go to. And, um, but I am pretty good at closing the door on Friday and not coming back until Monday. That's, that's fantastic. That's great. I, I do struggle with the idea of just like constantly thinking about work when I'm not at work. Yeah. Oh, I do that. Yeah. But I try not to. I try not to. Right. Try not to. But, right. All right. Well, this has been a great, if if chock full conversation today, Nikki Kinzer. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. They're great questions. And uh, we look, we have another list of questions that we're going to be taking on next week. Don't forget, if your question didn't get answered, it was probably about starting your own business. And so we've, shelved it for next week. Can't wait to talk to Linda Walker. Uh, And so live stream as usual on Monday morning next week. And uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank Thank you, everybody, for downloading and and listening to the show. On behalf of Nikki Kinzer, I'm Pete Wright. We'll catch you next week right here on Taking Control, the ADHD podcast.